1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to try to make it through to verse 12 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's go ahead and read. Paul says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Let's just pray one more time. Father, just thank you for your word. Thank you for the people who are here to hear it. Let it find a soft place in our hearts, Lord. Make us more like Jesus Christ. Lord, put your words in my mouth. I can't do this without you. In his name. Amen. Amen. All right. So chapter 2 of Thessalonians, Paul, he gives us a rundown for ministry. What ministry really is. What ministry really looks like. Now, if you recall, Paul was at this church. He got this church founded in a short period of time. All right. He was there three Sabbaths and he gets a bunch of believers together and he was persecuted. He was beaten. He was basically pushed out of Thessalonica in a rapid period of time. But he, he gets the church going and he gets back and he, and he kind of encourages the church. And there is a functioning, thriving church church there in Thessalonica. Remember, Thessalonica is, a, is our modern day would be like the northern part of, of, of Greece. Now, Remember in chapter 1, he talked about how this church was a, it was a obedient church. It was a growing church. It, it was a church on the move. It was a church that had a testimony that turned to God from, from serving idols, false gods. They turned to the true and living God. They were a witnessing church. How fast they got going with preaching and other people, bringing people to the Lord, it really got going in a rapid period of time. And Paul writes to them in chapter 1 to commend them for that and tell them to keep going, keep doing what you're doing for the Lord Jesus Christ. But with that, with any good in ministry, with any blessing in ministry, with, for, with any good that's going on in any local church, there's always the negative. There's always the accusations. There's always the, the naysayers. So Paul was getting accused at the same time from other people that were coming up in the church and against the church saying, well, Paul was only here a short period of time and he's a charlatan. He just wanted to take you for your money and your goods and this and that. And he just wanted to move on. And Paul gets wind of this. So he writes back to the church to encourage the church. And, and he writes back to the church, and the way he writes back to them in chapter 2, it's, it's kind of a model for what true ministry really is. Now listen, if you're here, the word ministry means service. That's what it means. And we're all in some level of ministry. If you're a parent, you're in ministry. All right? You serve your kids. If you're married, you're in ministry. You're supposed to serve your spouse. If you have some kind of other ministry, if you're a teacher or a Sunday school teacher, if you do anything with other people that you're supposed to be serving them, that's what ministry is in some way, shape, or form. If you have some kind of public ministry, then you're in ministry. And he kind of gives us a model in this chapter. 
And he kind of tells us what we're not to be as God's people and God's ministers. And he also tells us what we should be. All right? What we're not to be and what we should be. And, he's gonna, and he basically says in the first few verses, if you come with the gospel of God, we need to come, you need to tell people the truth of God, we need to teach the word of God, we need to teach it to our kids, with our spouses, to our spouses, in our churches, and there's going to be some negatives that come along with that. There's going to be some naysayers in regards to ministry, in regards to living for Jesus Christ in general. Now listen. Paul was being accused of being a religious charlatan. Things, some things never change. And it's it's amazing to me. Many Christians will support the charlatans and they'll call those who are really laboring for the gospel, the, the good ones, they're the thieves and the crooks. And it's like backwards sometimes. I just don't get it. And I'll, I'll, I'll have to help some of the people through things here. You watch, they watch some of the televangelists on TV and they're not all bad. Some of them are really good. But then I see them getting caught up in some of the crazy things that are going on. You know, this, this one guy selling water from the Jordan, you know, if you, if you buy this, seriously, if you buy this water and, you know, you have this water and, and you know, it, it, it's from the Jordan and, you know, you're guaranteed to be cleansed and healed if you rub it on your, your sores or whatever. And I'm like, okay, all right, all right. But pe- people fall for this stuff. So I had, a few years ago, I had a young lady come to me and she goes, what do you think about the, this water thing? I said, I think you can just go downstairs and get some water out of the sink. That's what I think. Seriously. I was like, how much was it? She was like, tw- she said, I had to pay for the shipping, and it was $25. So I'm thinking this little bottle of water that was this big, I'm like, the bottle cost six cents, and the water was free. They probably got it out of their tap. And they just got 20 How much money are they making? Now, that stuff happens all the time. It happens all the time. And, it, and it's sad And it's scary to me how people get caught up in this stuff. And that's kind of what Paul was being accused of. But listen, the way Paul defends himself, it's very interesting. He basically tells that church, you know me. You know me. You know when I came into Thessalonica, I I had already been shipwrecked. I had already been beaten. I came in with the scabs on my back, right? Because Paul was beaten and shipwrecked already prior to this. He was already stoned at Lystra and left for dead. And Paul basically says, you know me, don't you remember? And don't you remember when I came in, I had nothing. And when I left, I had nothing. He goes, don't you remember when I came in, I came in beaten and bludgeoned and I still left healing with scars on my back. And he basically tells them, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. You're going to see that over and over again in verses 1 through 12. You know, you know, brothers, you know this, you know that. He wasn't afraid to say and put it out there to the people, you've seen what I went through and what God did in my life. That's why, you know what makes me crazy sometimes? It's sad to me when like division starts in churches and sheep start to follow wolves that have never had any scars in ministry, that have never really served anybody. You got people that learn a little bit of the Bible. They got some gifts and some talents that are recognizable. And next thing you know, they think they can jump into the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world. And then people start to follow them. And they were never tested. They were never tried. They never had a testimony. They never went through the battles. They never went through the struggles of being turned on and turned against and beaten and bludgeoned like Paul was. And then you know what they end up doing? They end up causing churches and hurting churches and dividing people from people. And you know what? They end up hurting people. People. Instead of steering them to right shepherds to right places, to right churches that are going to stand on the truth, that have some men and women who stand on the truth, who have been through the battles of ministry. Instead of leading people astray. Paul said, remember he said in Ephesians, he said to the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 to the leaders, he says, after I depart, ravenous wolves will come in among you from your own selves, not caring and not sparing the flock. Right? Right? And Paul's testimony before the people was, you know this, you saw this. 
And, and, and I think that, listen, anybody standing up preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, anybody living for Jesus Christ, right, should have that kind of testimony. Hey, you've seen what I've gone through. You know what I've gone through. You know what I've gone through with my life, with my family, with these different circumstances. You've seen that, not just in public ministry, but in our private lives also. Some of us have some friends. We have some relatives. People should be able to look at you and say, man, you know what? These people have gone through some things. Maybe there is a Jesus. Look what he says in verse 1. Now, again, this is in regards to the accusations that were coming against Paul. For yourselves, brethren, know. There it is. Brothers in the church, you know this. Our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. But even that, after that, we had suffered before we got there and were shamefully entreated, as you know, there it is again, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. He says this wasn't easy. He says this ministry stuff was difficult. And then he says it wasn't in vain. You know why he says it wasn't in vain? Because people came to the church and people got saved. People came to hear Paul preach. People came to listen to a man that had been beaten and bludgeoned and left for dead, stoned, and he kept going for the cause of Jesus Christ. You know, that's what I say to the, you know, to the other men and women around here that are in leadership. Because they say, you know, I just want to not do this sometimes. So this, this just isn't worth it sometimes. You know, you try to do the right thing, you get accused of doing the wrong thing, right? And it's just, you know, and shots against your family, your this, your that, your life. And then I say to them, I say, listen, no one's ever going to understand or know what you go through. I said, but what else are you going to do? Who else can you serve? Right? Where else are you going to go? What else can you do? Because Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. So we get to keep going for Jesus. We get to keep serving Jesus, even if people throw stones, even if people say things, even if people accuse. We get to keep living for Jesus Christ, all of us, because where else are you going to go? What else are you going to do? He alone has the words of eternal life. We get to do this for Jesus when it gets hard, when it gets difficult. And and Paul says to the church, you know this, you've seen this, you've seen my life. And look what he says. We preach the gospel, look what he says, the gospel of God with much contention. With much contention. Listen, when the truth goes out, right? One way you know that it's the truth is that it hurts some people. It bothers some people. You've heard that before, the truth hurts, right? Right? And when you tell people, hey, you know what? God loves you. He sent the son to die for you. Yes, he did. He gave his life up for you. That's good news. That's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. But then when you tell them, listen, God paid the price for your your sins. You're a sinner. What? (laughs) And you have to turn from your sin and take that gift God has given to you. All right, well, I like the gift pot, but I don't like the sinner pot. And then it's, listen, and if you don't do that, you're going to take your chances standing before a holy God one day and, you know, you're not going to have anything to say to him. And you're going to be judged. You're going to be condemned. You're going to go to hell. What? I don't believe that. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. You know, if you go jump off the side of a building, you might believe you can fly. Right? Right? doesn't matter what you believe. But listen, if, if, if I'm going to rest my eternal soul on something, my eternal life on something, it's going to be on this book, on the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it's going to be on. It's not going to be on any of man's wisdom, any of man's thoughts. I'm going to rest it on this book that has stood the test of time and that is true and unchanging. And sometimes when you go tell people that, there's contention. Sometimes when you tell people about the truth of Jesus Christ, you know what? They don't want to hear it. They don't like it. Paul just talked about it. He goes, you know, brothers, how I came to you. It wasn't in vain. I got beat up for it by my own people, the Jewish people. I got stoned because of it. 
And remember, who was the chief contender against the church? It was Paul. It was the guy who wrote this. But then he gets saved. He gets saved. And he's willing to go through whatever it takes for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, much contention. He goes, why? Because this isn't my gospel. He says, it's the gospel of God. This is what the human race needs. They need the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what they need. This is what we need to live. This is what we need to preach. The gospel of God. Listen, man couldn't come up with this stuff. Man couldn't come up with what's in this book right here. It's the gospel of God. Listen, how, listen, you can break the Bible down into three words. I told you this before. Generation, degeneration, regeneration. Generation, God made everything and it was beautiful. Degeneration, man messed it up. Regeneration, God made it good again. Very simple. And when you tell people, hey, there's good news, but we mess it up. But there is good news. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. Regeneration. Some people don't want to hear that. And there's going to be contention. There's going to be strife. There's going to be difficulty. But Paul kept going. And he said to the church, listen, you know how you know that I'm legit as a preacher, as a minister? Paul said, you saw my life, he said. You watched me. He's going to dig into it a little more. Look what he says. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. Now listen, this isn't just for ministers. Even though you want to be in ministry, study some of this chapter. He's going to tell us things that we shouldn't do and the way we shouldn't be. Not, not just ministers, all of us should be not do these things, some of these things. And then he's going to tell us in verses 7 through 11, things that we should do and the way we should be. And he says to the church, look, at he says, when we came to you and we exhorted you, verse 3, it was not with deceit. That means we didn't conceal anything. We didn't hide anything from you. And then he says, listen, nor of uncleanness, we didn't dumb it down morally, the message that we were teaching. And then he says, look it, nor with guile, nor, nor sneakily. He spoke the truth. Now listen to me. There's crafty, sneaky, sly people standing up in front of people all over America and all over the world right now. Sneaky, crafty, and sly. Paul said, when we preach the gospel to you, we didn't conceal anything. We didn't dumb it down morally. And we weren't sneaky. We weren't sly about it. You know what Paul said? You know what Paul preached? The same thing Jesus preached. Hey, God loves you, but you have to repent of your sin. And you have to embrace Jesus Christ who saves us from the wrath to come. He told them the truth. Because that's the gospel. And listen, there's all kinds of ministers, all kinds of churches out there that don't want to say that repentance toward God in faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of ministries out there that say, hey, what can we do to get people in? What can we do just to get them in? And listen, I'm all about getting people in. I get that. But not if it comes at the cost of dumbing down the message. And they say, how do we minister to people's particular needs? What they need is Jesus Christ. What they need is a savior. What they need is to turn from their sin and embrace Jesus Christ. That's what we need. Godly sorrow that produces repentance. And there's all kinds of ministries out there. What can we do to get them in? What can we say? And they won't talk about sin. They don't talk about hell. They don't talk about judgment. They don't talk about any of that stuff. Let's just make some people feel good. And sometimes I say, I don't know why people come back here sometimes. Because I preach right through the Bible, and a lot of the times when I read it and I'm studying it myself, it doesn't feel good. i got to repent of it before I preach it. 
But don't you want to go somewhere where you know someone's going to tell you what God says? What God says? Not what man says? That's why it's the gospel of God. It's his truth. And, he, and it shouldn't come with, listen, deceit, uncleanness, or guile. There's whole churches and movements ordaining homosexuals. Now listen, stay with me now. Does God hate homosexuals? Well, God loves everybody. He's died for everybody, but he hates that sin. He hates our sin. Okay? And he had to die for that sin. So for a church to put someone in leadership and dumb down the word of God saying, hey, that's not what it means. God's okay with that. That's a problem with God. Oh, but you know, it's the culture of the age. That's just it's where we live right now. I don't know. My Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he hated sin back then, he still hates sin now, and that's why he died for it. And, and, and listen, and then there's churches out there. You'll get them right. You'll get them saved with the truth, and then they won't do any correcting. They won't do any exhorting. They won't do anything. They just kind of let people kind of do whatever they want. That's not what Paul did. That's not what Jesus did. Remember Jesus? Remember the woman <laughs> that was taken in adultery? Remember what happened with her? Remember the religious leaders dragged her out and they said, now we got Jesus because they saw Jesus was a preacher of righteousness, but they saw he was so merciful and he was so gentle with people and they said, what can we do to trip him up? So they get this woman who's taken in the very act of adultery and they drag her out bludgeoned and naked in front of them with the crowd watching and the religious leaders. And they said, hey, Jesus, master, they called him, rabbi. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Now they think they got him. Because they know he's a merciful preacher. They know he's a forgiving preacher. They know that's the way he was and the way he presented himself. He was a compassionate person. That's why they... At the beginning of his ministry, they said, who is this, Jeremiah? Because he was a weeping prophet. He was compassionate. You know what Jesus says? He said, let the law of Moses stand. If there's anyone among you that has no sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. Now, I know all the theology behind it and the doctrine. Where was the guy? He was in adultery too and all that. But the bottom line was she was in adultery. But you know what he says? If you have no sin, go ahead and cast the first stone, right? God can forgive that sin. But remember what happened? You remember what he said to her? First, everybody goes away from the oldest to the youngest. They leave. They go away. They drop their stones and they go away. And then there's nobody left except her and Jesus because they were all convicted because they were all sinners. And then he looked at the woman and he said, where are all your accusers? And he goes, she goes, Lord, they're gone. And he goes, neither do I condemn you. He could have condemned her. But no, remember what he said to her? Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So there's no such thing as, hey, let's just get people saved. Let's just get them in. And once we get them saved, get them in. Just let them do whatever they want. No, the, <laughs> the church is supposed to go and sin no more. You're supposed to try to stop doing the things you did before. Paul's going to get to that in verse 12 where he says, walk worthy now of that calling wherewith you were called. Look what he says. When we came to you, now these are things that we shouldn't do in ministry or we shouldn't do as Christians. We don't come with deceit, nor uncleanness, nor guile, that's sneakiness, craftiness. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Now listen, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. Listen. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. You know what that means? That means if you're constantly doing things because you're afraid about what somebody else is going to say or what somebody else is going to think, you have a fear of man. Paul said, I didn't do that. 
Paul said, you know what? I feared God for us because I was put in trust with a message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the news that the world needs to hear, that God can forgive sin, that God does forgive sin if people repent and embrace Jesus Christ. You know what? I was entrusted with that, and I'm not going to fear man. I'm going to fear God. I'm not going to kowtow to man. I'm going to stick to it, and I'm going to preach for God. And I'm not going to dumb down this message. That's what he says. Look what he says. He goes, not pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. And that, I know that's difficult sometimes. I know it's difficult to stand up for the truth when you know if you stand up for the truth, it's coming. It's hard and it's difficult to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, to stand up for the truth, to do something, you know, Right? When everyone else is going this way and doing it wrong, it's hard and it's difficult. And the pressures that come along with that. But you know what? We're not to please man. We're to please God. Because he's what matters. And listen, you're not, telling, you're not doing anything for anybody if you just tell them what they want to hear. You know that, right? You could pay. You can get, get your insurance and you could pay someone $100 an hour. I, mean, I think it's more than that, probably 200 an hour. And they'll sit there with you for an hour and they'll give you a stopwatch and they'll tell you how much of a good person you are. And you can, then you can come to church and then we can tell you the only thing that's good in you is Jesus Christ. Because everything else was crucified with him on the cross. Because that's what it says. Because that's the truth. But you're not doing anybody good if you can't tell them the truth. You're not doing anybody any good if you're not going to stand on the truth, if you're not going to fear God and not fear man. Look what he says. For neither, again, things that we shouldn't do as Christians, for neither at any time use we flattering words. As you know, here it is again, he goes, you know we didn't use flattering words, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you know, he goes, you saw my life. You saw my ministry. He goes, you saw the way I was among you. He goes, we didn't try to flatter anybody or trick anybody or tell people that you, you know, you're a nice guy. You're a nice lady just to get them. And we didn't do that. And he goes, nor a cloak of covetousness, nor did we do what we were doing just to get them in so we can get money. Because you know how Paul's going to prove that in the next few verses. He says, he's going to say he labored day and night. He made tents. A cloak of covetousness. Listen, people aren't stupid. After a while, if they stick around long enough, if this pastor up here is about the money for himself to pad his pockets, you're going to recognize that after a while. In any church. Now again, know what's interesting to me. A lot of pastors will stand up there and tell you that they're about money, but people still come. You know why? Because they think, hey, I can be successful like he is if I just keep doing what he says. Sad. The blind leading the blind. And he says, a cloak of covetousness. Nor did we do things sneakily just to get in people's pockets. Look what he says. Nor of men sought we glory. Again, things that we shouldn't do as Christians or ministers of the gospel. Nor of men sought we glory. We didn't do things so we can get patted on the back. Neither of you, nor yet of others, but we might, listen to what he says, but we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. He says, you know what? We could have came in and said, hey, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is what I need. I need my needs met in this way. I need a house. I need a car. Whatever car Paul had back then, I don't know. He goes, we could have did that as the apostles as opposed to the B apostles. Okay, you got it. You didn't get that one. All right, you're with me now. He goes, we could have done that. He goes, but we didn't do that because we didn't want to slow down the message of Jesus Christ at all. Now listen, we as Christians, we shouldn't do things sneakily, unclean, with guile, not, ple not, not for pleasing men. We're supposed to fear and please God. Not for a cloak of covetousness. You're not supposed to seek glory of one another. You're supposed to do things for the glory of God, the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, listen, those are things that we shouldn't do. 
Those are things that ministers should not do. Now here's things that we should do. But we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse, nurse or a nursing mother cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, listen, listen to what he says, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. He uses the illustration of what real ministry is. He says it's like a mother, a nursing mother. This is what real ministry is, he says. He goes, this is how we were among you. Again, he goes, you know this. And he uses the illustration of a nursing mother, and it's very interesting as to why. First he says, because they're affectionate. They're affectionate. I don't know, my, all my kids were breastfed, and I thank God for that, because it saved me a ton of money. <laughs> it didn't happen anyway. But not one time when my wife was breastfeeding, I don't want to get too graphic up here, did I ever see her take the baby and just say, here, yeah, slam, have some, bang. <laughs> Can't get, you know, that's pretty graphic, but now you get it. <laughs> but it was affectionate. It was gentle, right? The other reason why I'm thankful my wife breastfed is because when they screamed all night long, I was like, nothing I can do for you. Nothing I can do for you. They want you. They want you. Right? Now listen. That's how it is when you're dealing with Christians. He goes, we didn't impart to you the gospel of God only. Again, you know, when I first started in this ministry thing almost 20 years ago, studying to be in ministry, again, I was one of the ones, oh, what a great job. You get to study the Bible, you get to stand up there and preach, and then you get to just go home. And then you get to study the Bible, stand up there and preach, and then go home. What, this is an, what a great gig. That's only if you're a pastor that's imparting the gospel of God only. That's only if you think it's your job just to get up there and feed the sheep in public but not tend to the sheep in private. Not do more to reach people. Not do more to minister to people. And look what Paul says. He goes, we didn't give you the gospel of God only, but we gave you our own lives. And he goes, the illustration is of a nursing mother. You know what? Because that's laborious. That's affectionate labor. It's hard labor. It's difficult. It's tiresome. And again, you know, I, I get into fights with my wife years later, and it always comes up, you know, you didn't get up with any of them. And she's right. She is, sadly enough. But it's tiresome. It's difficult. It's hard. Because those kids needed to eat. Just like God's people need to be fed and God's people need, need to be ten, tended to and God's people need to be ministered to and God's people need to be corrected and exhorted. He's going to get into that in a minute. But the first illustration he gives is of a laboring mother who nourishes her children. He goes, Paul said, this is how we were among you. He goes, you saw we were affectionate toward you. We taught you. We were patient with you. We didn't think it was our job just to come in and preach and leave. Now listen, I'm going to tell you the difference between, I was studying from Pastor Joe Foch and he gave this illustration, it was a good one. So I figured I'd steal it from him, I steal a lot of things from him anyway, and I'll give it to you. He gave the illustration, this is the difference between an evangelist and a pastor. And he goes, you know, the dad's in the waiting room, the, the kid's just been born, and the, and the dad's, you know, passing out the cigars to his friends and talking all that. And he goes, oh, I did that. I made that little boy or that little girl. Look at this. Oh, this is great. See, that's the evangelist. The evangelist says they, they get mass crowds. They get people to come and hear them. They fill up auditoriums, and they get to preach, see conversions, and then they move on. But then the mother, she's the one, yeah, I'm the one that just squeezed the kid out and I'm half dead here. That's the pastor. See the difference? And he says true ministry is like that. It's laborious. It's toilsome. He goes, but it's worth it. 
Watch what he says. Verse 9. For you remember, he goes, you remember this. You know this, brothers. You saw my life. You remember, brethren, I labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. He says, don't you remember how when I came in, I was beaten, bludgeoned, beat up, and we went to work and we made tents and we labored day and night. Because we didn't want to be chargeable to you. He said, we could have came in and preached the truth to you that you never heard before, gave you the gospel, and took an offering and kept it. That's what he said. That's what he said. He says, but we didn't do that. Some of the other apostles did. Peter did. But Paul didn't. Now listen. It's funny. After 10 years of ministry, I, I still get accused around here. I'm in this for the money. It's pretty amazing. After 10 years, finally the board wanted me to take a full-time salary because I was doing too much out there. I wanted to do more here, and they wanted me to do more here. For 10 years. And it's just amazing. But what can I do? And then you could try to prove the truth to them, tell them the truth, share your life experience with them, do whatever you can do, but it's not going to matter because if you haven't realized this yet, people are going to say things anyway about you. They're going to say what they say. But the test of, listen, the, tr the test of tr true maturity in Jesus Christ is the test of time. It's the test of faithfulness. Is that guy still doing it after 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years? You know what? Because people will come and say stuff, then they'll go away, then you'll have other people who say stuff. It doesn't matter. Because Paul said we're supposed to serve God. We're not supposed to please man. Please man. But it's amazing because anytime God is doing a work anywhere, just like when I started this message, people are going to come and say things. People are going to come and throw stones. But take heart. That should be proof that God is at work in this place. God is at work. That God is doing a work. And I'm so thankful that I just get to be a little part of it. You should be thankful that you, can be, you get to be a little part of it. Now look at He transitions here and I... I'll finish up after this. He goes, true ministry is like that of a nursing mother. And then he says, true, min true ministry is like that of an exhorting father. He says, you are witnesses, verse 10, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. He goes, you watch my life. He goes, we lived holy, we lived justly, we lived unblameably. You know what that means? People are going to come and try to blame you for things and say things about you, but none of it should stick. None of it should stick. I get messages, listen, I get messages from, messages from people in this church all the time. Hey, I saw a brother so-and-so who used to come to this church, and he had a lot to say about you. I said, I'm sure he did. <laughs> and I say, hey, let's just do what the Bible says. Tell them if they have an accusation against the pastor, please go get a witness. doesn't even have to be anybody from this church. Go get an unbiased witness and come and make your accusation. You know how many came back and made the accusations? None. You know why? I keep banging into this thing. Because now I get really fired up. You know why? Because they're not true. That's why. That's why. Same thing, you, all of you have been through this in some way, shape, or form. People have said things, people have said this, and you say, well, you know what, have them call me. Let's, let's talk about it. And then they don't do it. Listen, unblameably, he says, we behaved ourselves among you. People are going to cast doubt and blame and everything else, but it shouldn't stick. It shouldn't stick. As you know, verse 11, how we, listen, exhorted, comforted, in charge every one of you as a father does his children. Look what he says. He goes, true ministry is laborious and toilsome, and it should be affectionate like a nursing mother. And then he says, true ministry is like that of a loving, exhorting father. Because what does a father do? Look what he says. A father, what? Exhorts, comforts, in charges. Listen, exhort means to oversee, basically. And what he's saying is this. And I'm always playing referee in my house as, as the father. All right? Six kids in the house, me and my wife. A lot of the times, you know, 
This, this battle's that going on. People think as you're a pastor, they, oh, they get up in the morning and they have this hour and a half of prayer with a candle. They don't even put on, you know, the lights in the house because they don't believe in electricity or whatever. All right. <laughs> Seriously. All right. And then we, you know, we pray for an hour and everybody's just, no, it's, nah, 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 those are mine. Those are my jogging pants. That's mine. This, this, this. Oh, shut up. <laughs> yes, that's what I say too. And then my wife will tell them, no, you shut up. You're supposed to be a better example. You're telling them to shut up. And you wonder why they're talking to each other like that. I'm like, all right, you're right. And I'm saying inside to her, shut up. <laughs> right? Now listen. You can ask my kids this stuff is true. But a lot of the times I have to oversee things, exhort, I have to referee. I have to get them together and say, all right, what happened? All right, this is the way it is, though. This is what we're going to do. Stop doing that, this and that, just like we do with God's people. Stop treating that person in the church like that. Stop thinking that they're thinking this about you. They're not thinking this about you. Stop doing what the Bible says. This is what God's Word says. We do the same thing in the church. Just like a father does with his kids. And then he says he comforts them. He comes and he builds them up. You can do it. Yeah, you struck out four times, but this is the time you're going to get a hit. You can do it. And then it says, look it. He exhorts, he comforts, and then sometimes he has to charge. You know what that means? You're going to do it my way or the highway. Sometimes fathers have to do that. Sometimes I have to say that to my kids sometimes. No, no, no. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. I already did the referee thing. I already did the company thing. But now we're going to do it this way because I know what's best for you. Paul said, that's the way I was with the church. He goes, not only were we affectionate like mothers, but we exhorted, we comforted, and we charged just like fathers do. And sometimes we have to get with God's people, and we have to tell God's people, hey, you know what? Stop doing this. Stop doing this, and this is what we're going to do. Because we want to glorify Jesus here. Look at the result. Look what Paul, all that Paul's motive was, and this is all he wanted, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. See what he says? Why was he affectionate toward them? Why was he loving? Why did he have to charge them sometimes? Why did he have to build them up? Because he wanted them to walk worthy of God. You know what that means? That means, listen, Jesus Christ died for you. You're not that same person anymore. The same thief, the same conniver, the same lazy person. You're not that anymore. Those things were crucified with Christ. All things, listen, they're becoming new in Jesus Christ. Walk worthy now. Amen. Let the Lord live in you and through you. Listen, that's what, the same thing First John says. He goes, I don't have any greater joy than to see that my children are walking in the faith. And sometimes we sit around sometimes as, as the leadership and we say, oh man, I just wish we saw more fruit in people's lives. Oh, I wish these people would just get it. I wish that, but you know what blesses us more than anything? Because some people do get it. And the ones that don't get it, we have the hope that they're going to get it and they're going to walk more with the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to do more for God and they're going to make an impact. But everybody grows differently. It's different for everybody. Some people like Paul, they're surrendered and they get it right away. Some people, you know what? You got to water those roots and you got to water those roots and you got to water those roots for years. And the next thing you know, they sprout up for the glory of Jesus.